unfortunately get worse before it gets better. Something I don't like saying about things, but that's the way it is. It's the way, it's what we have. You look over the world, it's all over the world. It will probably get worse before it gets better. A stark shift in messaging from the president tonight after weeks of downplaying the risk of COVID-19. The U.S. may have 10 times more COVID-19 cases than reported. The alarming new numbers tonight and what they mean for you. The dire message from health officials tonight, no one is immune. Inside the American community where dozens of babies under the age of one have tested positive. All eyes on Portland tonight as the backlash to federal deployment is sparking new demonstrations. As long as the violence continues, we'll have to maintain our elevated presence. My conversation with a top DHS official. What this is, is a very uh, low blow power grab. A potential VP pick for Joe Biden weighs in on what Democrats are calling an unconstitutional attempt to impair the census. And taking the edge off your wanderlust, our old Bob Woodruff takes you on an epic journey to some of the most interesting places in the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, we have all seen it during this pandemic. Americans have been exercising their rights to free speech and assembly to demand change. But as some protests have turned violent in several cities, there's now a debate about how to best respond. In Portland, Oregon, protesters are facing off against federal agents angered over what they say are illegal detainments, where unidentified agents have been seen pulling demonstrators right off the street. The White House is defending its use of the agents, and now President Trump is reportedly ready to send more than 100 of them to Chicago. The mayor there says the city intends to cooperate, but does not want a repeat of Portland. Tonight, we ask a top Homeland Security official whether these federal agent deployments are constitutional. But first, Arcana Whitworth leads us off from Portland. Tonight, reports that federal agents may soon deploy to Chicago come as Portland is facing what could be its 55th straight night of protests. Overnight, demonstrators trying to break into the federal courthouse. It's just before 3 o'clock in the morning here in Portland. Things are still going. There's so much tear gas in the air that my eyes are burning. In a Nightline interview, the acting DHS Deputy Secretary saying tonight, those security agents in Portland are within their rights to protect the courthouse. This is a long-established federal practice. It's well within the authority of the federal government. But Oregon State is suing those federal agencies, and Chicago's mayor says they don't want those security agents, even if it's to help police fight crime and gun violence. The Trump administration is not going to foolishly deploy unnamed agents to the streets of Chicago. 53-year-old Navy veteran Chris David says he suffered a broken arm at the hands of law enforcement in the Portland protests, and that he was shocked by his treatment. I don't know who they are still. I don't even know what agency they are from. No names, no agencies, nothing. And Kana joins us now from Portland where those protests have been continuing each night. Most protesters have been peaceful, but what are you seeing on a nightly basis and at what point do things seem to get out of control? You know, Lindsay, it's interesting because it almost seems like clockwork every night. These protests start out quite peacefully. I'm telling you, we're seeing moms marching in. Last night we saw dads marching in. People are singing. There are quite literally people walking around handing out pizza and hand sanitizer. There's music. It almost has a concert-like feel. And then as the night goes on, it really turns into chaos right around midnight. We almost have more protesters that join. They're prepared for this. They're prepared for the tear gas. They're prepared for the pepper bullets. And they're ready for that each night. And so it just seems as if they can't quite figure out how to let the protests go on peacefully. They went on, Lindsay, until at least 5 o'clock this morning. There were still things burning all around the city of Portland at 5 in the morning. And so, Kata, in what way do most people there see this situation resolving? And will protesters eventually fade away, or are people now digging in their heels? I mean, certainly that's a huge question. I would say that the protesters passions have been ignited in the recent days, uh, especially people I spoke with say they are very upset with the actions of the federal government agents. They do not think that they should be in their city snatching people up into unmarked cars. That has driven moms out here. They say they feel like they need to protect not only their kids, but the young people that are protesting. They want to make sure that they have a voice. And then when I spoke with the president of the police union, he quite literally said there will no be end in sight. 
until our elected officials are able to sit down and come to a compromise here. And he does feel that they just cannot continue on like this. But the protesters aren't going anywhere. All right, Kena, our thanks to you and stay safe out there. Earlier, I spoke to yeah. the Department of Homeland Security's acting Deputy Secretary Ken Cuccinelli about the deployment of federal agents to Portland and whether that's potentially against the law. Take a listen. In the past, we've seen federal agents go into cities to work with local authorities versus right now, it seems that they're being brought in to work independent from local authorities. Is that constitutional? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when we're operating on our own, we're, we're enforcing federal law. Uh, take the Portland situation. Uh, we have, since the building of the Hatfield Courthouse, the Federal Protective Service, which is the base DHS agency there, has protected that facility. So this is 23 years uh, of effort in just for that facility. So this is a long established federal practice. It's well within the authority of the federal government. Government. Whether the local authorities or the local city wants the help or not. Well, there's a federal courthouse and a federal building in the middle of Portland. And so with that comes the federal authority to protect that facility and the people in and around it. Uh, so we always prefer to have law enforcement relationships be partnerships with localities and states. And over the vast majority of America, that's what happens, even when there are political differences among the leadership. Um, but that is unfortunately um, an exception in, in Portland, though there are other cities that uh, we have tenuous political relationships with that have very good law enforcement relationships. You'll be able to see more of my interview with Deputy Secretary Cuccinelli tonight on Nightline. And turning now to the fight to contain COVID-19, the startling new number from the CDC tonight, 10 times more Americans may have gotten the virus than previously thought. Our Victor Akendo is in hard hit Florida, where just today more than 9,000 people tested positive for coronavirus. Tonight, that alarming new report from the CDC the number of COVID-19 infections in the first months of the pandemic estimated to be likely 10 times higher than previously thought. The study looking at antibody tests in 10 cities and states from March to May, finding depending on the location, the case rate could be 6 to 24 times more than initially reported. We're now in July, with hospitalizations on the rise in 40 states. The South looking like the Northeast did in April. Moments ago, in his first coronavirus briefing since April, President Trump acknowledging the severity of the pandemic. It will probably, unfortunately, get worse before it gets better. Hospitals like Baptist Health here in Miami are pushed to the brink. It's exhausting every day. We feel like we're in a race, a marathon. With just one ICU bed left, nurse Rachel Evers says it's wearing on the staff. Compared to March and April, what are we seeing now in the ICU? Oh, March was just a tip of the iceberg. And every day it's coming into more patients and they're very sick. <laughs> As cases rise, the debate over reopening schools raging. The clock is ticking. Uh, Mindy Grimes Fesky is one of dozens that. of educators and uh, parents suing Governor Ron DeSantis, who wants kids back in the classroom. The governor suggested that teachers who don't want to go back inside of a classroom could do something like take a sabbatical. Could you, could other teachers afford to do something like that right now? Absolutely not. I mean, to make that statement just lets us know that he is not in touch with what's happening. She and her husband are both teachers, and they're concerned they could bring the virus home to their son, who's immunocompromised. In a congressional hearing today, executives from five pharmaceutical companies said they hope to have hundreds of millions of doses of affordable vaccine to be ready by next year. They were asked if they would send their kids back to school without one. I honestly don't know the answer yet, even for my three children. Uh, we're wrestling with the same challenges parents across the country are trying to figure out the right thing to do. So you, have you come to a conclusion? No, sir. We're, we're talking about that tonight at dinner. I don't know yet. Just if, if you're confused, think about that all across America. Vice President Pence with a different message. I can tell you with my wife seated right here, if our kids were elementary school age or high school or college, we wouldn't hesitate to send them back to school. Because I've been looking at this data every day. Tonight, the virus continuing to take a deadly toll on frontline workers. Fiona Tulip mourning her mother, Isabel Papadimitrio, a respiratory therapist in Dallas. 
writing this scathing obituary, blaming politicians and their lack of action for her death, writing, like hundreds and thousands of others, she should still be alive today. Even inviting Texas Governor Greg Abbott to her mother's funeral, saying his statewide mask mandate was too little too late. I invited him so that he can see behind these numbers there are real people who are suffering. Faye Jackson, Alabama. In Washington, D.C., this striking image, the National Nurses Union placing 164 pairs of shoes on the lawn of the Capitol to mourn their fallen. Some poignant images there. Victor joins us now from a testing site in Miami Beach. What's the wait time like there? And is there concern tonight about taking too long to get results still? Lindsay, it depends on what time of day you've come. We've heard from people who have had to wait five hours for a test right here at Miami Beach. I myself waited two hours at a different state location here in Miami. But now Miami-Dade and Broward counties, they're going to start adding testing locations. And as far as the results go, the labs are still clearly overwhelmed. I've heard of people taking as long as 18 days to get the results back. 18 days. Wow. And we also heard in your report the concern about schools, how the virus could affect children and parents. And, and you have news tonight about summer camps right so summer camps in Miami have all closed after some campers and a counselor they tested positive and that is just going to further complicate the debate over reopening schools Lindsay all right to be sure Victor Akendo thanks so much for your reporting Next tonight, to the smallest victims, one Texas county near Corpus Christi reporting more than 85 babies under the age of one have tested positive since mid-March. One baby has died. The medical examiner says these numbers show no one is immune from this virus. Our Marcus Moore reports. A young mother tonight recounting the moment she learned her two-month-old daughter is battling the virus that has swept the globe. I had a panic attack. Uh, I literally just started like pacing and I couldn't breathe because I was just so nervous. Last week, Angelica Wendell's daughter Evie's giggles and smiles replaced by a cruel fever, congestion, and rash. Everyone's like, oh, well, kids don't get it. So when you find out it's COVID, it's just like heartbreaking. Thankfully, Evie is improving and will be okay. But she is just one of an alarming number of children who've apparently been infected across the country. Over the weekend, officials in Nueces County, Texas, revealed 85 infants there have tested positive for the virus since March, 60 of those this month. Nueces County has the highest positivity rate in the state. The six-week-old baby died there in June. COVID-19 symptoms are generally milder in children than adults. A recent study of Chinese children showed 90% of children who tested positive had mild to moderate symptoms or none at all. But that study also showed that 10% of infants who tested positive became very ill. And younger children, especially infants, had more cases of severe illness. We have to keep in mind that newborns and infants have underdeveloped immune systems. So that may be one of the reasons why COVID can hit particularly hard in this group. Back in Arizona, little Evie is getting better. Her mom thinks she got the virus when her sister visited recently. Just be careful, even if you don't take like your baby outside, just be careful who you let around them because you think even your family's fine, but you may not know exactly what they're doing. And it is really sad to watch your child sick, especially with this disease that like no one really knows a whole lot about. <laughs> People taking extra precautions around their infants now, and Marcus joins us from Dallas. Marcus, what are health officials telling you there about these cases in, in infants that they're finding? Well, Lindsay, what we've heard from doctors is that, that, first of all, infants are more vulnerable than older kids, and it makes it all the more important to practice social distancing measures. They also say it is true that infants uh, require closer care, and that makes for a very difficult balancing act for doctors uh, and parents as they try to stop the spread of COVID-19. All right, Marcus Moore, thank you so much. And now to the White House, where today President Trump made a return to the briefing room for the first time since April to resume his regular COVID-19 updates. The president making his case for his administration's handling of the pandemic and now advocating for Americans to wear masks. ABC's Mary Bruce has the latest. He's been downplaying the virus for weeks. So when the president today declared the situation will get worse before it gets better, it was a major about face. But that's the way it is. It's the way, it's what we have. You look over the world, it's all over the world. It comes as the president's political advisors warn he will likely lose in November unless he convinces voters he's taking the virus seriously. 
Our latest ABC News Washington Post poll shows Joe Biden now with a 15-point lead nationally and a 20-point edge when it comes to trust in handling this pandemic. Biden today hitting Trump hard. It's been reported by the president's staff that the president is, quote, not really working this anymore. He doesn't want to be distracted by it. Today, the president out to prove that's not true, stepping up his calls for Americans to wear a mask. We're asking everybody that when you are not able to socially distance, wear a mask, get a mask. Uh, whether you like the mask or not, uh, they have an impact, they'll have an effect, and we need everything we can get. But Trump himself has been reluctant to wear one. Just last night at a fundraiser at his Washington hotel, wearing no mask. Today, the White House press secretary said that's because the president is tested multiple times a day. Our John Carl pressing the president. And your press secretary said today that you sometimes take more than one test a day. Well, why is that? And how often? Well, I didn't know about more than one. I do take probably on average a test every uh, two days, three days. And I don't know of any time I've taken two tests in one day, but I could see that happening. Um, so Republicans and Democrats have, on Capitol Hill both said that they want to see uh, more money for testing. They want to send billions of dollars to the state so they can do more testing. And you probably saw Mick Mulvaney the other day uh, said that uh, his kids, it took them a week to get test results back. He said this is simply inexcusable uh, given where we are in the pandemic. Do you think we have a problem with testing in this, this country right now? Well, and are you in favor of more money for testing? We've done more testing by far than anybody, but those numbers will be coming down. I agree. I think it's a good thing if we can do it. Are that. you in favor of more money for testing? If the, if the doctors and the professionals feel that even though we're at a level that nobody ever dreamt possible, that they would like to do more, I'm okay with it. The president now saying that he'll rely on scientists to determine his future actions. Mary Bruce joins us now. Uh, Mary, it seems like the president was not only changing his tone, but also changing his tune, outlining several stances he hasn't regularly advocated for. What stood out to you what the, in what the president said today? Well, it is pretty remarkable after hearing the president for so many weeks really downplay this crisis to hear him come out and say that things are likely going to get worse before they will get better. It is a change in tone and a change uh, in political strategy for the president. It, of course, comes as he has seen the real political toll so far uh, of the way that he's been handling this pandemic. We've seen that reflected in the fact that, that, that his approval rating on this issue has been sinking. Also, of course, hearing the president, who himself has only been seen publicly in a mask once come out and now urge Americans that they should do so is a pretty remarkable change. The question, though, Lindsay, is what is the president going to do about this? Now that he uh, seems to be admitting the scope of the problem, what is he and his administration? What plans are they going to put forth to try and really tackle this growing crisis? Right. Big shift in strategy. We'll see if there's a change in action. Congress is now having that debate on the next round of economic stimulus. Break down to the developments today on talks and where things are headed next. Well, there is still a lot of fierce negotiating going on up on Capitol Hill tonight. Some progress was made today, though. We did see the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, come out and say that Republicans will support another round of stimulus checks. That is very good news for a lot of Americans, though it still remains to be seen just how much uh, those checks will be for and when they will go out. Uh, a big sticking point, though, continues to be uh, the amount of funding, whether there will be any uh, additional funding for testing and for the CDC. We know that Republicans and Democrats on the Hill want to include billions of new funding to expand critical testing. The White House initially uh, was very cool to that. They said they did not want additional funding simply because much of the money that has previously been allocated hasn't been spent yet, they say. But it does seem uh, today what we are hearing that the administration's willing to give a little bit on that. You heard that even from the president's tone tonight. Bottom line, Lindsay, uh, the next stimulus package is uh, a far way from being done right now. Okay, Mary. Bruce, thanks so much for your insight as always. And joining us now is Congresswoman Karen Bass, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Thanks so much for joining us. Sure. And you've certainly spoken eloquently in recent days on the passing of your friend and colleague John Lewis saying Congress has to live up to his legacy. But are you concerned at all that Congress may not be able to live 
up to that legacy as far as addressing issues of racial and social justice when the two sides just seem to be so far apart. I mean, as you know, Congress failed on police reform in the wake of nationwide protests, and the two parties are now nowhere close to the same page on voting rights issues that Congressman Lewis championed. Well, I mean, I think ultimately that says that we need to take care of some of this in November uh, by changing some of the Senate seats, that's for sure. But I absolutely do not concede that we have failed on police reform. Uh, we still have several more weeks before we're out of session. And uh, I do believe that we will be able to be successful. We need to bring all of the pressure we can on the Senate, not just to pass police reform, but how about passing the HEROES Act so that people uh, can have their unemployment insurance extended. I want to turn now to, to efforts on the next round of economic stimulus during the pandemic. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell outlined the GOP plans today, calling for another round of direct payments to Americans, as well as funds for hard-hit industries and to support education and child care. What will Democrats insist must be in this next bill in order for it to pass in the House? Well, well, again, remember, we passed a bill over a month ago, the HEROES Act, we passed it, and it has what you just mentioned in the bill. Now, I haven't seen the uh, fine print in terms of what McConnell is talking about, but our bill has been languishing over in the Senate for over a month. So I think that it is a shame that we make people go to the brink we put the everybody's under so much stress because of COVID, and it is unnecessary to stress people by waiting until the last minute to extend unemployment insurance and to give stimulus checks. They've been sitting on his desk for over a month. And, and speaking of going to the brink, I mean, those expanded unemployment benefits are set to expire in the next week, and we're also approaching the end of the month when bills for businesses and homeowners and renters are due. So are you confident that Congress can act quickly in the next week in order to reach a deal so that more economic pain doesn't hit Americans as COVID cases continue to rise? You know, I'm completely confident that Congress can do it. I think Congress can and will do it. But the point I'm making is, is that this was just unnecessary considering that the bills were passed a long time ago. And so the idea that people don't know whether they're going to get evicted from their house, I mean, one of the things that we had put in the HEROES Act months ago was uh, first responders, the first responders and our essential workers. So the cities need money, the counties, the states. In my state, in the state of California, we're going to have very serious uh, deep cuts in the state budget unless this money is received. And so I don't think that Congress should be let off the hook for just letting bills sit and languish when the work really was done. So when the Senate gets its act together and sends us the bills back over here, uh, I'm sure that we will be able to reach an agreement. All right, so Congresswoman, humor us here for a minute. Let's turn quickly to the 2020 race. Joe Biden said last night that there are four black women being vetted on his short list for vice president. I know that you don't want to speculate on your chances, but you recently were endorsed as the best pick for VP by both conservative George Will and labor activist Dolores Huerta. So what do you think that they see that would make you the best pick? And, and how will you make your own case if you're interviewed by the Biden campaign? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. I think it's by the uh, the campaign. And I believe that the vice president, I mean, there's nobody better to know what a vice president should do than one who has served in that role. And I'm hoping that the vice president picks someone the same way that he was to President Obama. The sad everything we can to make sure that's happened. I just hope we're not on the brink of a depression. I hope we're not on the brink of a depression, and I hope that the death rate isn't up to 200,000. I mean, we have a president right now that it doesn't seem to have phased him that he has lost 141,000 Americans on his watch. So somebody that will be a good partner to the vice president and somebody that will help heal this country. Our country has been torn apart for the last three years, and we need to heal domestically, but we also need to clean up our international relations because so much damage was done by the Trump administration. And, and so let me just try and put you on the spot one more time, Congresswoman, and say, do you think that you could be that good partner to the president and also healer to the country? Well, honestly, I want to do whatever I possibly can do. I am there ready to work. 
I'm ready to walk precincts, even though I'm not sure how much of that is going to go on. I do still think it's it's necessary. And I'm ready to do whatever I can to make sure that Joe Biden is sworn in in January and then every day of his presidency to make sure that he is successful. So in whatever way I'm called on, I'm ready. Uh, one other issue, the president today signed a memo aimed at excluding undocumented migrants from counting when congressional districts are reapportioned based on the 2020 census. Regardless of whether this holds up to legal challenges, are you concerned that this could have a chilling effect on immigrant communities participating and being counted in the census? Absolutely. I mean, I think, and it's such a tragedy, it's an example of how the president has torn us apart, because from the day one of his announcement, he has used race. Knowing that it's the Achilles heel in this nation, he has used race to divide everyone. And so using the question of immigrants, because he's not talking about Canadian immigrants, okay? Using the question of immigrants, number one, to scare people from even filling out their census forms for those people that haven't done that, but then to exclude them from the political process. What this is, is a very uh, low blow power grab for the next 10 years to make sure that the Republicans stay in power. Because as the country has changed, as the country has become much more browner, they're trying to look for how do they stay in power. And so the best way to stay in power is to exclude people. Now, I'm worried that this is going to happen during the election in November, too. People should not have to risk their health to vote. We should be able to vote at home in the same way the Republicans have done for years. It was their primary strategy. And so the idea that the only way he can win is by cheating, I think is just a stain on our democracy. Congresswoman Karen Bass, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And when we come back $3 trillion later and more on the way, our look tonight at where all the stimulus money is coming from and are we reaching a point of no return in our national debt? And our conversation with the mayor of an East Coast city that just put reparations on the table amid a national racial reckoning. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. In one place, the vital information, the straightforward facts, what you need to know. Helping you protect yourself and your family. ABC News, pandemic, your questions answered here. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to the heated debate over how to boost our economy and provide much needed relief to millions of Americans impacted by the pandemic. House Democrats have passed a new $3 trillion relief package, but Republican lawmakers are working on their own bill that they hope to cap at just $1 trillion. These are, of course, mind boggling sums. And so tonight we ask where does the money come from and what happens when we explode our deficit? ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has this report. It's the other side of the unprecedented government spending in the face of coronavirus. Staggering numbers. The U.S. budget deficit setting a new one-month record in June as spending outpaced revenue by more than $864 billion. Spending to combat the coronavirus and shore up the economy far outpaces the revenue that the government is bringing in. In just four months, the U.S. has shoveled upwards of $3 trillion into the gaping economic hole created by the pandemic. This is happening at breakneck speed, and it requires a response that is also at breakneck speed. From those $1,200 stimulus checks to an additional $600 in weekly unemployment benefits to $517 billion in PPP loans for small businesses and $790 billion in federal aid to state and local governments, the airlines and hospitals, sending our total national debt already climbing before the crisis surging to a record $26.5 trillion. That's more than $80,000 for every single person in the U.S. 
Is there a point of no return? So I would say that most economists believe that this isn't the time to consider debt and deficit. We have to contain this virus and it should take everything we've got. But all that spending so far still isn't enough. Unemployment, while declining, is at the highest level since the Great Depression, currently above 11 percent. And many states are still fighting coronavirus outbreaks that threaten to shut down businesses and crush consumer spending, the lifeblood of the U.S. economy. Many in Washington sounding the alarm. Our objective is to try to get something done before the enhanced unemployment and charge six fires. We want to get people back to work, but we know there are certain parts of the economy that still are impacted. Congress and the White House pushing for another one to three trillion dollar stimulus package. And who will be paying this debt? Will it be children? If interest rates go up and the economy doesn't grow, then the burden on our children and grandchildren will be heavy, heavy. But again, that is not inevitable. With a total national debt now larger than the economy itself, the most critical need for the U.S., say economists, is generating growth. I do want to also emphasize the other danger, which is prematurely turning back to austerity. So we made that mistake in 2010, 2011, and it took us a full decade to get the economy back to where it was in terms of unemployment uh, prior to the financial crisis. If we don't take drastic measures now, they worry the toll could be even greater. I believe that there are bankruptcies that are just building up. Do you believe this is escapable? Yes, absolutely. But that action has to be taken now. As we learned in the Great Recession, it's not just a matter of how much, but where that money goes. If you go back to 2008, 2009, many of the very policies that were employed in order to get us through that crisis are the very same policies that are being employed now, the difference being the magnitude. Back then it was billions, today it's trillions. Do you believe that policies, for example, the Federal Reserve going out and purchasing debt uh, for private companies, is that the best way to stimulate this economy right now? I don't think we want to make the perfect the enemy of the good. There are a lot of urgent needs getting uh, food stamps to people, getting unemployment insurance payments to people. At the same time, things happen that none of us like. We don't like it when mega corporations get PPP loans. We don't like it when uh, the airlines get uh, bailouts, or at least I don't. If we worry about crafting the perfect plan, we end up not meeting the emergency. Does it incentivize, in your view, bad behavior? For example, you mentioned the airlines. They've made choices with their money like share buyback programs and dividends to their shareholders as opposed to investing heavily in their people. You're, you're quite right, but the midst of a global pandemic is not the time to deal with that problem. Going forward, it won't only be the debt we owe, but also the interest on it. Nearly $400 billion this year alone. More than the combined federal budgets of the Commerce, Education, Energy, DHS, HUD, Interior, Justice, and State Departments. There are fortunately many people who are willing to buy U.S. debt and be paid a very low interest rate in order to own it because the perception is the world is a messy place right now and the U.S. is a safe space in that messy world. Is there a number that's just too high, that's untenable? We know higher debt is more dangerous because at some point interest rates can go up, but it's a mistake to focus on a magic number uh, because what the right number is depends on how fast the economy is growing. Is it not a claim on future growth in some way? It can be a drag on future growth. If we have to pay more taxes in order to service a larger debt, then those higher taxes uh, prevent us from pursuing other opportunities. But I think at the moment, uh, the imperative has to be getting food on people's tables, 
keeping viable firms afloat, uh, keeping our healthcare system going, and to worry about higher taxes 10 years from now at the expense of doing what's really imperative in an extraordinary time today would be a mistake. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis. And much more ahead tonight on ABC News Prime. The deal tonight between the NFL and its players after some raise serious concerns about playing football during a pandemic. Also, the milestone being celebrated tonight on the baseball diamond. And the latest on Kanye West's presidential run, while many are worried about the star's mental health. But our tweet of the day, another pro football team changing its name. The Canadian Football League's team in Edmonton dropping the term Eskimo from its name. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. Do you trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Now to new questions tonight after a Twitter rant from rapper Kanye West claiming that his wife Kim Kardashian wants to lock him up. This on the heels of that weekend speech that left many questioning his well-being. Our Diane Macedo has more. Rapper Kanye West raising concerns with a series of tweets, some aimed at his mother-in-law and wife, claiming the duo wanted him locked up. Kanye writes to his 30 million followers, Kim was trying to fly to Wyoming with a doctor to lock me up, like on the movie Get Out, because I cried about saving my daughter's life yesterday. The tweet references a comment West made at his first presidential campaign event in South Carolina on Sunday. Claiming he became pro-life after conversations with his wife, Kim Kardashian West, during her first pregnancy. She said she was pregnant, and for one month, and two months, and three months, we talked about her not having this child. Kanye says it was Kim who ultimately insisted on keeping the baby. But even if my wife were to divorce me after this speech, she brought North into the world, even when I didn't want to. She stood up and she protected that child. Kanye also tweeted to mother-in-law Kris Jenner that she will not be allowed to see his children. West is currently at his ranch in Wyoming while his wife and family are in California. He later tweeted, I love my wife. My family must live next to me. It's not up to E! or NBC anymore. According to People magazine, Kardashian West was furious at her husband for sharing intimate details about their daughter. Earlier this month, West announced his intention to run for president. The artist has stirred up controversy with other social media rants before. His recent behavior now raising concerns for the rapper, who has also been open about managing his bipolar disorder in the past. When you're in the state, you're hyper paranoid about everything. Everyone now is an actor. Everything is a conspiracy. You see everything. You feel the government is putting chips in your head. You feel you're being recorded. You feel all of these things. 
Our thanks to Diane. And still ahead on ABC News Prime, an American city's dramatic step toward coming to terms with the wrongs of its past, considering reparations for slavery. Also, polar bears on the brink? Is global warming driving the species to extinction? And road trip, a father and son's journey through some unlikely destinations, finding hidden treasures and life lessons along the way. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. States are trying to deal with an increase in coronavirus cases and in some hard-hit cities, a surge in hospitalizations. The New York Times finds the number of COVID-19 cases is surging in at least 40 states. Hospitalizations also on the rise with 39 states reporting an increase. And now a new study published in JAMA Internal Medicine estimating the number of COVID infections reported from March to May is likely 10 times higher than the official estimates. Today, Vice President Mike Pence in Colombia for a roundtable on school reopenings. We really do believe that it's possible to safely reopen our schools. And we think that's in the interest of our kids. We think it's in the interest of working families. And it's in the interest of America. Urging Americans to wear face masks. On Monday, President Trump threatened to send more federal law enforcement officers to cities around the country against the wishes of state and local officials. Portland's mayor says it's just making the situation worse. Your presence here isn't wanted. It's not needed. It is clearly ratcheting up the violence and the vandalism. Trump is vowing to send 150 military-style federal troops to Chicago to help with gun violence in the city. Unlike what happened in Portland, what we will receive um, is resources that are going to plug in to the existing federal agencies that we work with on a regular basis. Two Chinese nationals charged today by federal prosecutors. Campaign targeted intellectual property and confidential business information held by the private sector, including COVID-19 related treatment. They're also charged with stealing trade secrets from companies. Targeted industries included high-tech manufacturing, medical device, civil and industrial engineering, business, educational and gaming software, solar energy, pharmaceuticals, and defense. According to the indictment, these malicious cyber activities began more than 10 years ago and were ongoing as of the date of the indictment. As NFL rookies arrive for training camp, the league and the players union have reportedly reached a deal. According to a memo, players will be tested every day for the first two weeks of training camp. Then they'll be tested every other day. And this is a compromise. The players wanted daily testing while owners preferred every other day. ESPN has learned the league has offered to scrap all preseason games. Polar bears could be extinct by the end of this century unless more is done to address climate change. That's the verdict of a new study. Researchers say shrinking amounts of Arctic sea ice is forcing the bears onto land farther away from the food supply. 
And now to the deadly attack on the family of a federal judge in New Jersey. We're learning new details about the alleged killer who was found dead in an apparent suicide, including a possible connection to another murder. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has this report. Tonight, authorities uncovering disturbing twists as they investigate the attack on New Jersey federal judge Esther Salas's family that left her only son dead and husband in the hospital. Law enforcement sources revealing suspect Roy Den Hollander is also being investigated in the killing of Mark Angelucci this month in California. Mark was an angel here on earth and he will be greatly missed. Sources say the gunman in Angelucci's killing was dressed similarly to Den Hollander, wearing a FedEx uniform when police say he opened fire on Salas's 20-year-old son Daniel and husband Mark Anderl on Sunday. A 2015 case in which Den Hollander, a lawyer and self-described anti-feminist, represented the plaintiff was presided over by Judge Salas before another lawyer took over in June 2019. Authorities seen removing boxes from his New York City apartment. Sources say Den Hollander killed himself in upstate New York on Monday. The names of a dozen others were found in his car, including New York State Chief Judge Janet DeFiore. Two guns and cash were also found sources say. North Brunswick's mayor, a Salas family friend, says the town is in shock. Every time I would ever speak with Mark about Daniel, Mark's eyes would light up. Hi there, Lindsay. Here in North Brunswick, New Jersey, U.S. Marshals are still guarding the house where suspect Roy Den Hollander opened fire. Authorities are now looking into whether he was involved in another murder across the country. Our thanks to Stephanie. And we turn now to a dramatic move by the city of Providence, Rhode Island, in the middle of nationwide protests over police brutality and racial inequality. That city has committed to truth telling, reconciliation, and reparations to its black and Native American communities. To discuss what this means, we bring in Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza. Thank you so much for joining us, Mayor. Great to be here, Lindsay. So you signed a declaration last week committing to a three-step process that might ultimately lead to the payment of reparations for past wrongs. What convinced you that this was necessary and why now? Well, it's always the right time to do the right thing. And what convinced me, what convinced me to go this route is the conversations I've had with leaders in the black community. And it was clear from their testimonies that the injury runs so deep. And if we wanna make the most out of this moment that we're living through right now, then we gotta to go to the root, we gotta to go to the source. And that means tackling the truth around slavery and discrimination in our country and reconciling that with who we believe we are and then doing something about it. So that's why we've committed to going through this process. And you've said that you're still in the first phase, which is truth telling. Now, if this does lead to reparations, what would that look like and where would the money come from? It depends. And uh, what we've done is we've committed ourselves publicly to this process. At some point in the future, there'll be a committee that's established and that committee will be responsible for uh, putting forward a set of recommendations for what reparations should be, what the scale, the length, who should qualify, all of those important questions. Um, but those are questions to be answered by another day. I believe that this process is going to bring our city together and uh, through the truth telling and then the reconciliation process and uh, create the link that history isn't just a thing of the past, but history actively shapes the present and it's something that many of our residents are living with. And I believe that we're, we all as human beings have this moral instinct that if we confront a patent injustice, we wanna do right, we wanna fix it and be part of the solution. So I believe that our community is going to come together and that leads us to the reparation stage of this. Whatever it is that we need to do as a community to make things right, then we'll be prepared to do that. The last point that I'll make is that I'm also very well aware that there's no way that our city or any city can completely right the wrongs of the past and make people whole for all of the discrimination and, and injustices that they have, they have suffered. But it's my goal that we can uh, take a leadership role and encourage other levels of government and other institutions, private and nonprofit, to also step in and be part of the solution as well. So we're hoping that we will uh, not just uh, bring our community together, but uh, bring some other allies along as well. And, and you kind of touched on this, but you're taking action at the local level. Do you think that this truth telling and reparations for slavery and other injustices be a national project led by the federal government? And are you hoping that your work will, will ultimately lead us all there? You know, the more that I've thought about this, I've always assumed that it should be at the federal level. But the reality is that if we want to go through the truth-telling and reconciliation process, 
there's no more powerful level for those conversations and those those uh, that process to happen and at the local level. So the more that I think about this, the more I'm convinced that, yes, it does have to be a national effort, but it has to be one that engages our local communities first and foremost. So there's a, a very important leadership role that all cities throughout the United States can play in this. And I believe that by showing this leadership at the local level, we can finally bring this issue to a head at the national level and make sure that we have states and the federal government step in to also be part of the solution here. Lastly, Mayor, I've heard people say before, you know what, I don't feel responsible for the sins of my grandfather. What do you say to that person? So what I would say is I, I would urge them to be part of this process, and I would ask them to listen to uh, the voices of the black community. And uh, what's so clear to me is that history is not something that just happened in the past and uh, does not influence the present. But instead, history is something that you know, is still living with us and is still shaping the present in very real and active ways. When I've spoken to leaders in the black community, I've been moved by how deep the injuries run and how deep those injuries uh, still, still influence their lives. So I ask people to be part of this process, come to it with an open mind and an open heart. And I think that all of us will be moved that if you know, we're confronted with just patent injustice against a member of our community, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be moved to want to do something about it. So we want to engage as many people as possible. And I trust that inherent human spirit is gonna bring people in to not only want to have this conversation, but to use it to grow and to use it to right the wrongs of the past. Mayor Lorza, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. And now to an epic journey to some of the most interesting places in the world in a new series called Rogue Trip on Disney Plus. Our own Bob Woodruff and his son Mac partner with our friends at National Geographic to travel to countries with reputations that might make them seem like unlikely tourist hotspots. I spoke with Bob and Mac yesterday, but first here's a sneak peek of the new show. My son Mac and I are on a big and beautiful adventure. I used to be a war correspondent until I got wounded, blown up in Iraq. But I didn't want my kids to grow up fearful because of what happened. I'm Mac Woodruff. My dad has seen the worst in some of the world's most troubled regions. And now we're hitting the road to seek out the best in them. You have to make it bigger to show love. <laughs> I wanted to connect with people in more of a real, authentic way. <laughs> I love doing this right now, but I love doing this with you. My 10-year-old self would probably be pretty jealous of all the time I get to spend with you now. Looks great. Excited to see that. Bob and Mac join us now. So it sounds like you guys are, are trying to show these countries in a new light. What did you find during your travels? Oh, so, so much, Lindsay. I mean, it was... Uh, I think we have these images of certain countries going through, you know, war catastrophes, environmental collapses, and we just wanted to make sure that people have a chance to see some of the these countries in different places at different times. And I think we saw beauty that we didn't even know was there. We knew there was beauty, but we saw things that we didn't really know what was there before, and and a lot of fun things to do. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. I imagine uh, strengthening the father-son bond along the way. Yeah, I, I mean, it's been a long time since I spent so much time with my dad, not probably since I was 15, 16, 17 years old. And even then, I was just itching to get out. But it's a different experience when you're 28 and you get asked to travel with your dad to, to make a TV show to go all around the world. It's been probably the best. It was probably the best four or five months of my life. And we definitely bridged the gap between father and son and became roommates again and colleagues <laughs> for the first time. So it's, it's been un unbelievable. I was a better father than I was. <laughs> time of your life. That sounds so exciting. Uh, what did you find to be the most surprising throughout this journey? What was the most surprising for you? I think seeing Ethiopia was probably the most surprising to me. I, I had such a concept in my head of what this country looked like, and it didn't look anything like that. I mean, it was didn't feel impoverished, didn't feel like there was a drought, it didn't feel like it looked like a desert. I had all these images of what Ethiopia was. And what we actually saw were these massive mountains and these lush fields and these some of the we hung out with the fastest runners in the world and we saw Africa's biggest cave. These are all things I didn't know existed within its borders and I just fell in love with the place. I think that probably was for me it was uh, Chernobyl in Ukraine. Who would have thought that we could go to the most you know dangerous place in the world like that? And I, mean, I just remember 30 years ago when that happened and you know, the most radiational 
destruction in the history of our planet. And there we were with, with my kids <laughs> walking through Chernobyl. So that was a little shock to me. And Bob, you've reported so much on the human experience, traversed the globe many times, but in this show, we're going to see you guys get well acquainted with some wildlife, like speaking of Ethiopia, a hyena that was there. What were some of those experiences like? Well, I think we were almost, uh, we were kind of risking our lives to be so close to those particular ones. So they have the, the strongest, most powerful bites of any animal in the world. And there they were right, right on our, our shoulders. As we, yeah. Risky. Uh, the hot breath of a hyena on the back of your neck is something that I don't recommend to most people, but it was an incredible experience. We saw a lot of beautiful things in Colombia. We were in the Amazon, Ethiopia. We, we went and saw you know a bunch of wildlife at high altitudes that I didn't know existed. We went on a safari. Um, Papua New Guinea is full of, full of amazing wildlife. We went searching for crocodiles with our bare feet. We did something called a turtle rodeo, which was basically a scientific exercise in tagging male turtles, where you just jump onto their backs off of the side of a boat. We, it's a lot of stuff out there. And we survived. And, and Bob, why was it so important for you to bring your son along for the ride with you? I think it's just the same that I wanted to tell everybody out there in the world, because he's, he's my son that you know grew up watching this on television. He watched his own father in places like this reporting only the bad, and he didn't get a chance of the good. And I just wanted to make sure that he knew that, yes, I was making some risks when I went to these types of countries, but I also wanted him to know that I wanted to show something to somebody in the, in the, in the present time. You know, I want people to know that things have changed for a lot of these countries. And even if the countries are still in bad conditions, they still have amazing spots within them. We didn't want to be unbalanced reporting too beautiful or too bad. We wanted to somehow establish that, that mix somewhere in the middle with a real, a real uh, ratio that was proper. And it's educational. Priceless expedition, we can imagine, uh, for both the two of you as, as father and son and, and world travelers as well. We're excited to see it. Bob and Mac, thank you so much. Be sure to watch Road Trip, which starts streaming on Disney Plus on July 24th. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And next on ABC News Prime, a milestone in the world of Major League Baseball, the first female coach taking to the field. In one place, the vital information, the straightforward facts, what you need to know, helping you protect yourself and your family. ABC News, pandemic, your questions answered here. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor. Overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live, streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. 
starting out with a milestone for Major League Baseball. It only took 144 years, but baseball finally saw a female coach on the diamond. Alyssa Nackin became the first woman to coach on the field during the late innings of the San Francisco Giants exhibition game last night. The 30-year-old joined the Giants in 2014 as an intern. She was a four-time all-conference softball player in college. After the game, members of the team applauded her. Outfielder Hunter Pence saying congratulations on making history. And Mauricio Dubon added, congrats on becoming the first ever. I'm honored to share the field with you. Our best wishes to her as well. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Lady Liberty donning a mask. Well, not quite. This isn't the actual statue, but the replica on the Las Vegas Strip, reminding people in Nevada of the mandatory face covering policy for anyone out and about in a public space. A message of safety on a face mask that is nine feet wide and five and a half feet tall. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night.